talking about um, <laughs> demographics, the Republican Party, the 2016 campaign with our three guests here. <coughs> Congresswoman Dina Titus, we are actually in her congressional district, the first district of Nevada. Um, she has been in Congress, this is her third term. Um, you are also, some of you, maybe all of you know about Congresswoman Titus, but she is a known nonfiction writer. She is a former professor who is also an expert, I found this interesting, in the history and policies of nuclear power, nuclear weaponry, and nuclear waste. There's a lot of that here in Nevada. <laughs> right. Next to her is Sig Rogich. Sig is the president of the Rogich Communications Group. He's a longtime Republican campaign strategist. He's also the former United States ambassador to his native country of Iceland. And he was a senior assistant to former President George H.W. Bush in the White House. Sig, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you. And last but not least, Mariana, Maria Elena Salinas is one of the most recognized Hispanic journalists in the United States. She is co-anchor of the nightly newscast Noticiero Univision and co-host of the news magazine Aquí y Ahora. Please welcome our three panelists. Okay, we have 19 minutes and two seconds to solve all the demographic Perfect. issues um, plaguing uh, the 2016 presidential campaign and in particular the Republican Party. Now, after the, the Republican Party lost the White House once again in the 2012 presidential election, there was a, a very famous document done, it was released in 2013, that's euphemistically known as the GOP autopsy. I've written a lot about it. And my favorite line in the autopsy comes from none other than um, former House leader Dick Armey. And Dick Armey told um, the GOP strategists and consultants who put together this, this autopsy, this fantastic line. You can't call someone ugly and expect them to go to the prom with you. Mm. Yeah. And this was in relation to the Republican Party's relationship or lack thereof with mm -hmm. the Latino community. That was in 2013. We are now in 2015. Is uh, the Republican Party still calling people ugly? And how, can we ch and how can the party change that once there is a nominee? And I'm gonna pick on you, Sig, first. Well, I hope they're not calling them ugly. There's uh, a lot of them. And uh, I don't think that uh, if we repeat the uh, election statistics that we had in, uh, in the last election cycle where we got 25% of the uh, Latino Hispanic vote, it's, uh, it's, a no it's an unwinnable election in my opinion. Uh, couple that with the fact that uh, they, uh, they lost uh, the black community vote by 87%. They lost uh, the uh, Asian vote by 47%, I believe it was, and they lost the uh, Hispanic vote by 44%. The essence of all this, it means that uh, changes have to be made, and they, I think that Reince, as the chairman of the party, is doing everything he can to do that. There's approximately uh, 200 people in the, uh, throughout the country working full-time. There's 150,000 volunteers uh, trying to reach out and touch base with the uh, communities to uh, change that whole dynamic. And something transformational happened, you know, for this is a party that uh, Ronald Reagan won significantly uh, among the Hispanic voters, and 20 years later they lost it in the same dramatic fashion. So I think they recognize that. I think there's an opportunity to reach out. I think that uh, Republicans share the same values. Uh, that uh, are important to the uh, Hispanic uh, Latino community. Uh, I know that uh, if you were to list their, their key issues, you know, it, you talk about jobs and the economy, you certainly talk about taxes, and uh, one of the other more important issues that they're focused on in those communities are, is the uh, increase in the minimum wage. And I don't think Republicans have done a good job of telling the reasons why they shouldn't have that. You, know, you said that um, in your response in terms of the Latino community, there, there are a lot of them. There was a report done by a Republican outfit called Insurgent Republic where they had this spectacular statistic. This was in 20, uh, this is 2015, so 2013. Their statistic was every month for the next 20 years, 50,000 US born Hispanics turn or become eligible to vote. 
And uh, that leads me to you, uh, Maria Elena. Um, you know, I want your response to what Sig had to say, but also your observations of what what's happening in the Repub in the middle of the Republican primary process. Okay, yes, it's true. Every 30 seconds, a Latino turns 18. And one thing that people need to understand is that the image of Latino community is usually immigrants, and they're not. The majority of the growth in the Latino community is of US-born Hispanics. So their potential is tremendous. Uh, it is estimated that in 2016, there will be 28 million Hispanics of voting age. Uh, Sid was right in saying that there's a great potential there. There is a great opportunity. However, that opportunity is not being taken advantage of. And are they still calling them ugly? I think it's worse than calling them ugly. They're calling them criminals and rapists, and they're calling and they're blaming them for for the for the crimes and and for drug and for drug. Okay, you can say that it's one candidate. It's one candidate saying those names, but then you have the rest of the candidates that did not come out and defend the Latino community and did not come out and say, it's not true, this is not happening. So, you know, he's right when he says that there are issues that are very important to the Latino community. In the last uh, Univision poll, number one issue is jobs in the economy, number two is education, number three is healthcare, and immigration is number four. It's number four, but it's in the high, it's still in the 90s. And immigration is an issue that people feel very passionate about. It's one of the issues that drives their Latino vote. And even though Latino voters don't have an immigration problem because they are citizens, they either at one point were immigrants, they have someone in their family or, or a friend or a neighbor who are immigrants. And when you insult undocumented immigrants, uh, there's a feeling that you're insulting the whole community. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's a very passionate uh, topic for everyone in the country uh, on both sides of that topic. Congresswoman, I mean, we're in your district. Um, are you seeing that passion that Maria Elena is, ta is talking about? Well, absolutely, but I would remind you that it's not just the Hispanic population. In District 1, the Asian population is the fastest growing uh, ethnic population across many countries in Asia. I have the most diverse district in the state. We've got everybody from Thailand to Ethiopia. It's a very interesting district. But I would go back to the point about calling them ugly. Aside from the rhetoric that you hear from the people who are running for president on the Republican side, let's look at the policies that the Republicans in Congress have stood for. They will not bring immigration reform up for a vote. They've been opposed to the Voting Rights Act. They didn't want the Violence Against Women Act to apply to Native American women or women who are undocumented, that's, that's called them pretty ugly, if you ask me, and it crosses a lot of different ethnic boundaries. Sid, go ahead. I, I want to make just a couple corrections, if I might. First of all, it's 60,000 that are born monthly. It's not 50. So the number's even higher mm -hmm. from what, I can, uh, what I've been able to determine uh, from all the stuff that I've read about it. And there was one candidate, Jeb Bush, who did apologize and did do after Mr. Trump for those uh, ridiculous remarks that he made. So I'd like to give him credit for that. And I think there's an understanding among the Republican Party candidates that they're not going to win in 2016 unless this is corrected. And I think they have time to correct that. And I think you'll see things that are a reflection of that. We can debate about the Immigration uh, Act, and, and it's debatable as how you, to how you get there. But I think that there have been some precise uh, plans and, and uh, opportunities put forth that are just going through the same process that, it, that everything goes through in Congress. It's a debate until you die issue, and then it goes away, but it stays there. It's one of those kinds of things that goes on. I know that they certainly would like to find a, a reform package that's reasonable and that's uh, uh, well represented on both sides of the aisle. So. I think that those will be forthcoming. I would remind you that a bipartisan bill passed the Senate, so we have had that debate and had bipartisan support. Uh -huh. That's right, and it's the House that just will not even bring it up for a vote. Well, maybe, maybe we'll see some changes there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it just, it's just funny. I, I have this theory that the day that John Boehner decided that he was going to resign happened to be the day after the Pope spoke at, at, <laughs> in Congress. And John Boehner is actually the one that decided not to put the uh, immigration reform up for a vote. And I just wonder how much the words of the Pope resonated and, 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 
and went, you know, overnight as he was sleeping and made him decide in the morning that I'm going to resign today after the Pope said, uh, you have to see foreigners and immigrants, don't be afraid of their numbers, see them as human beings, see them as, see them as people, see their faces, hear their stories, and you see John Boehner in the back crying. So I wonder if he has a change of heart, and if maybe before he leaves, he will put it up well, for vote. That was the question I was—that was the question I was going to ask. Do you think? I mean, the, the Speaker Boehner leaves on October 30th, and Sig, there are a lot of big issues sitting out there for the potential next speaker if John Boehner doesn't take care of it: the comprehensive immigration bill, the raising of the debt ceiling, the budget, the continuing resolution that expires on right. December 11th. Uh, do you think that Speaker Boehner should do all those things to clear the decks for whoever the next speaker is, and in that way making it possible for whatever the conversation is happening in the Republican Party on Capitol Hill does not infect what's happening on the presidential stage? Well, if, if that could be done, yes, that would be I ideal. But he's only got two weeks to do it. And uh, as and a practical matter, for the next eight days. And uh, as a practical matter, I don't think you're going to do that. We don't, yeah, that's right. But I would remind you, let's not make Mr. Boehner a hero. He's been opposing this for a long time. It's kind of like Richard Nixon. He looks good in retrospect after some of the things that have come since him. Let's don't give Mr. Boehner too much credit. This crowd is a little stacked, by the way. I hear a lot of clapping. Going on. <laughs> Listen, I think what? Mr. Boehner did have a great deal, uh, did give a great deal of thought to this. I, I spent time with him a week before he resigned in New Orleans at an event we hosted for him. And, um, it, and I think that the, uh, the highlight of his life was to bring the Pope to the United States and have him address the Congress. There's a man that goes to church every day. He's devoted to his faith. And uh, it offered an interesting thought for me. I think this pope is probably as inspirational to the Catholic community as any pope in my lifetime. And um, I think that demographic model might change too. Uh, it's an interesting look at the, de the Catholic vote in America and what it might do here in this election cycle because of the pope and the messaging that he's bringing forth. So I think that's something that you might see more of. Can we talk about the switch gears and move away from um, immigration and Hispanics, since we're talking about dem demographics, we're talking about another big demographic group um, that's getting a lot of attention, and that's women. Um, Hillary Clinton has seen her support among women plummet uh, in the last few months, and there was a poll out that I can't remember where it was, but just a couple of days ago showing that it's plummeted 10 points in the last five days. Secretary, then uh, Senator Clinton was criticized in 2008 for not running on the historic nature of being possibly the first woman president, and now it seems like that's not going, that's not good enough. People, the, being a woman is not something that's attracting women to her candidacy. Is that a fair characterization, Congressman? Well, we've always had a gender gap that favored the Democratic Party, and so if you see an erosion among women voters, then that's something to cause alarm. I think when we get past all the entertainment stage of the of campaign and start talking about the issues that affect women and children, the, the bread and butter, kitchen table issues, those women uh, will come back. Also, as you target different other uh, minority groups who will be big players in this election, there's a multiplier effect. They're not mutually exclusive. For example, in the Hispanic community, if you get the mama, you get the whole family is what they say, and so that will bring some women in there. Young people, young women, that's, this is a demographic that the Democrats are going to have to go after, the LGBT community. So I think you will see that start to settle out as we get into the serious stage of the campaign, and that's what this debate, I think, will help to kickstart. You mean the debate tomorrow night, but you were mm -hmm. nodding your head vigorously there, Maria. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think that being a woman can be an asset, but it can also be a liability when you're running for office uh, because there's a, a double standard. You know, on the one hand, they could say, yes, oh, that's a wonderful idea. We might have the first woman president, just like the excitement that was around President Obama to have the first African-American uh, president. But at the same time, uh, when she's out campaigning, and we saw that in 2008, there's so much scrutiny on her campaign style and, 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 and how she presents herself it's not the same thing for a woman, and I'm telling you from experience, and I'm sure you have too, 
uh, a woman can be perceived, uh, while a man will be perceived as assertive, a woman will be perceived as aggressive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that double standard is still, is still there, and that's, you know, so she has uh, something on, that's positive, and then at the same time, it's a liability. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I'm not surprised that her numbers went down 10%, because I think they were inflated to begin with. I think it's an insult to think that women are going to vote just because it's a woman. You know, I think they're going to look at issues and how she's performed. I think the issues that she's confronting right now are as important to women as they are to men, as important to Latinos as they are to the Anglo population and so forth. And that she hasn't answered those properly. Her poll numbers reflect 61% of Americans believe that she's dishonest or, or lying. That's a huge number to overcome in the American to, for, for the American voter. And so I'm not surprised she's lost a good deal of support there. I think Republicans have to reach out to women as they do individuals. I don't think, uh, I think there are issues certainly that, that are focused specifically on, the, on, on women's uh, issues and, uh, and we'll certainly address those. But by and large, we share the same issues. The economy, jobs, more women in the workplace, they understand jobs, they understand taxes, they understand what they have to pay to the federal government. They understand the same problems that everybody else does. I think that's what I think that's why the debates are so important because that's when the candidates I mean that's when the voters actually get to hear the position of the candidates on the different issues and not rely only on name recognition or popularity to make your decision. You need to make your decision based on facts and, and on, on, on the candidates' positions. That's why these debates make a difference. And, well, I think that's why she will be talking about issues that affect women. She's not appealing to women because of what she's wearing. She's appealing to women because she's talking about things that the Republicans, again, going back to what I'm accustomed to in the House, who have been against women. The attack on Planned Parenthood and women's health, the, the reluctance to do the uh, Violence Against Women Act. They will not do the equal pay for equal work. They refuse to even bring that up. These are issues that women care about. She's on the right side of those issues. Now, I mean, Sid raises a, Sid ra raises a good point in that you know, issues that are um, important to women are issues that are important to everyone. I mean, you, you mentioned jobs. Jobs are important to women as they, jobs are important to Latinos and African Americans and LGBT Americans. But don't, don't, Sid, don't you think that people who are watching this campaign, when they hear candidates from the left or the right, talk about these issues, jobs, immigration, health care, um, um, personal safety, that they want to be able to see themselves in the responses from the candidates. Sure, absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, but, you know, uh, you can, we can pick out specific issues. Planned Parenthood is a good one to talk about. It was not an attack on women's health, in my opinion. It was an attack on Planned Parenthood for taking advantage of something that they should never have taken advantage of. They brutalized something that should be part of our system, in my opinion. I'm not saying take it away, but I think they need to play by the rules. And the rules do not call for some of the heinous things that occurred under Planned Parenthood. That's not the, so the issue is not going after women's health issues. But I think this thing, uh, the issues today, you have to remember, are going to be a lot different 10, 11, 12 months from now when these things are moving targets. But all in all, it's going to get back to jobs, the economy, and historically, any incumbency has never been reelected when the national poll figures reflect 40 to 45 percent approval rating for the economic situation in the country. We've That's almost, it's never happened, and it probably won't this and, time. And we have 90 seconds before the end of this panel, so I'm going to give each of you a, a, a moment to say a, a last word. Maria Elena. Uh, I think I, w I was just going to add that at the end of the day, I think what's going to make a difference is turnout, is the enthusiasm that you see in all these different groups and women and African Americans and, and Hispanics. Will they feel you know, excited about the election or will they be turned off and decide to stay home and not vote? And that's what's going to decide you know, who's going to win. That's an issue. Sig Rogich, I would agree your with her word. entirely. You know, the, turn, the voter uh, turnout is about 40 seven percent or something like that uh, in the uh, in the presidential election uh, the same with the Asian community they don't have a high voter turnout and yet uh, you're absolutely right it is a growing growing base so I think that's what you look for who can get their voter base out what kind of energy is there and I think we'll see a lot of changes on, on who the candidates are about that time 
and Congresswoman Titus. Well, I agree. The Democratic Party's always been a big tent. You can see that in the people we elect. I'm part of a minority majority caucus. You can see it in the issues from voting rights to uh, immigration reform. And you can see it in the policies that our candidates are talking about. And I think that Hillary Clinton will continue to talk about those issues and you will see excitement generated among the young people, among women, among different ethnic groups. And uh, I think it's going to start uh, tomorrow night. Congresswoman Titus Sig Rogic, Maria, Maria Elena Salinas, thank you very much. 12 presidential election. There was a, a very famous document done, it was released in 2013, that's euphemistically known as the GOP autopsy. I've written a lot about it. And my favorite line in the autopsy comes from none other than um, former House leader Dick Armey. And Dick Armey told um, the GOP strategist and consultants who put together this, this autopsy, this fantastic line. You can't call someone ugly and expect them to go to the prom with you. Oh. Yeah. And this was in relation to the Republican Party's relationship or lack thereof with the Latino community. That was in 2013. We are now in 2015. Is uh, the Republican Party still calling, we're gonna be talking about um, demographics, the Republican Party, the 2016 campaign with our three guests here. <coughs> Congresswoman Dina Titus, we are actually in her congressional district, the first district of Nevada. Um, she has been in Congress, this is her third term. Um, you are also, some of you, maybe all of you know about Congresswoman Titus, but she is a known nonfiction writer. She is a former professor who is also an expert, I found this interesting, in the history and policies of nuclear power, nuclear weaponry, and nuclear waste. There's a lot wow. of that here in Nevada. <laughs> right. <laughs> Next to her is Sig Rogich. Sig is the president of the Rogich Communications Group. He's a longtime Republican campaign strategist. He's also the former people ugly, and how can we, ch and how can the party change that once there is a nominee? And I'm gonna pick on you, Sig, first. Well, I hope they're not calling them ugly. There's uh, a lot of them, and uh, I don't think that uh, if we repeat the uh, election statistics that we had in, uh, in the last election cycle where we got 25% of the uh, Latino-Hispanic vote, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an unwinnable election, in my opinion. Uh, couple that with the fact that uh, they, uh, they lost uh, the black community vote by 87%. They lost uh, the uh, Asian vote by 47 percent, I believe it was, and they lost the uh, Hispanic vote by 44 percent. The essence of all this, it means that uh, changes have to be made, and they, I think that Reince, as the chairman of the party, is doing everything he can to do that. There's approximately uh, 200 people in the, uh, throughout the country working full time. There's 150,000 volunteers uh, trying to reach out and touch base with the uh, communities to uh, change that whole dynamic. And something transformational happened, you know, for this is a party that uh, Ronald Reagan won significantly uh, among the Hispanic voters, and 20 years later they lost it in the same dramatic fashion. So I think they recognize that. I think there's an opportunity to reach out. I think that uh, Republicans share the same values. Uh, that uh, are important to the uh, Hispanic, uh, Latino community. He was United States ambassador to his native country of Iceland, and he was a senior assistant to former President George H.W. Bush in the White House. Sig, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you. And last but not least, Mariana, Maria Elena Salinas is one of the most recognized Hispanic journalists in the United States. She is co-anchor of the nightly newscast Noticiero de Univision and co-host of the news magazine Aquí y Ahora. Please welcome our three panelists. Okay, we have 19 minutes and two seconds to solve all the demographic Perfect. issues um, plaguing uh, the 2016 presidential campaign and in particular the Republican Party. Now, oh. after the, the Republican Party lost the White House once again in the 20, 